I was awakened this morning about 1 o'clock this morning. I woke up. I'd actually gone to bed and had a little slight headache. And I should have known better. I said, well, if I go on to sleep and I wake up in the morning, my headache will be gone, knowing that if I went to sleep with a slight headache, when I woke up in the morning, I'd still have a headache and I'd get up feeling bad. So I uh, woke up about 1 o'clock this morning, and I and I'd had a dream. And uh, I, I debated about whether to share this this morning, but when I got up here, the thought was on my mind, so I presumed that it was the Holy Spirit. And uh, I, I had this dream, and uh, there were some people in my dream, and I won't mention who those people are. Uh, <laughs> and, and, I was, and I was standing before the congregation, and I asked the question. I said, what's been the theme for the last six weeks? And nobody knew. Nobody knew what the theme had been for the last six weeks. And, and I remember having to get through that awkward moment, you know. It's just like, you know, you've been pouring your heart into speaking before the people you've been called to minister to for the last six weeks. And, and seriously, nobody could remember the theme. And uh, I don't know how it came about, but I got in the car with, uh, and I, I don't know why Hugh Richardson was in my dream. He's our director of missions and got a relationship with Hugh, but it's not like we pal around or anything, but uh, I was able to vent to Hugh. Nobody can remember the theme. <laughs> that was me venting. A few weeks ago, I, I, uh, we, we, we took a look at 1 Peter chapter 3 and in verse 15 where we are instructed as Christians, we're, we're told as Christians that we should sanctify Christ as Lord in our hearts and that we should always be ready, that we should always be prepared to give a defense to everyone who asks us the reason um, asks us a reason for the hope that is in us. We talked about what it means to sanctify Christ as Lord in your heart. The word sanctify means to set apart. And so to sanctify Christ as Lord, it means that you set him apart. Sanctify Christ as Lord in your heart, in your innermost being. The analogy that I've always used is that you put Christ the Lord on the throne of your heart. So that he is your ruler. He's your boss. And so, to sanctify Christ as Lord is to set Christ the Lord apart in our lives, in our innermost being. We make him our Lord by acknowledging his holiness. And by revering him for who he is. And by revering him for what he is. He is the Lord of the universe, and he is in control of all things. And so when we sanctify Christ as Lord in our heart, we put him in control of our life. Have you done that? And then Peter tells us that we should always be ready. That, that as Christians, we should always be prepared to give a defense to everyone who asks us a reason for the hope that is in us. So what Peter is telling us is that as believers, we should be able to give a verbal defense of, of what we believe. We, we should be able to present a rational basis for the Christian faith, and we should be able to defend the faith against objections in those who oppose the truth. We have said in previous weeks that as Christians, we should know what we believe. And we should know why we believe what we believe. And we should be able to defend it biblically with good theology and sound doctrine. Peter said we should always be ready to give a defense. And we looked at that Greek word defense. It's the Greek word apologia. 
from which we get the English word apologetics, which is the Christian discipline of defending the faith through the systematic use of information. And in this series of messages, I have argued that the best tool or the best uh, weapon that we have for defending the faith is the Word of God because God's Word, God's Word is the final authority for faith and practice. Isaiah put it like this. He says, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the Word of our God stands forever. And so we've talked about the authorization for us as Christians, the authorization for us to defend the gospel, the, the authorization for us to stand for the truth is mandated to us by God. We are, we are commanded by God to stand for the truth. God's word is truth. And as we learned last week, as defenders of the gospel, we are called to cast down that which raises itself against the truth. We are called in Jude, and we're going to look at this passage again this morning, but, but Jude tells us that we are to earnestly contend for the faith. And we talked about that word contend last week. It means to, 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 to convince, to, 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 to try to win, to compete strongly. And when worldly philosophers threaten the church or when worldly philosophies threaten our beliefs as Christians, as defenders of the faith, we are to express them for what they really are, fools. We looked at that passage in Romans chapter 1. And when persecution arises, as it surely will at times, for Paul tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 12, he says, everyone who desires to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. And so we're taught in Scripture that when persecution arises, we must be ready with the defense. And when false preachers or false teachers arise and introduce erroneous or false doctrine into the church, as defenders of the faith, we must denounce the error. And, and as Christians, we, we should know the word of truth well enough to know when we hear error whether it's preaching on television or preaching on the radio or when somebody says something that's in error, that's in, a, that's in contradiction, that's a contradiction to the Word of God. Currently sharing with you some fundamental biblical principles for being a better witness for Jesus. And so the first fundamental principle that we talked about thus far is the authorization and the stand for truth. The stand for truth is mandated to us by God. We're to stand for the truth. Keeping in mind what Peter said, when we stand for the truth, Peter says in, 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 in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, he says, Sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. Always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. And he says, do this with meekness. Do this with, with gentleness. Do it in humility and do it with fear and with reverence. The second principle that I want to share with you this morning is the aim. We've talked about the authorization. This is the aim. The aim, the aim or the goal of defending the faith. What is, what is the goal of defending the faith? The goal of defending the faith is to glorify God. The goal of being a witness for Jesus Christ is to glorify God. That's the goal. And the goal of defending the faith is to glorify God. The goal of, of, of wit being a witness and telling people about Jesus is to glorify God. How do we glorify God in defending the faith? How do we glorify God in being a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ? We do it by reaching the lost. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether you eat or whether you drink, whatever you do, whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Paul said this in 2 Corinthians 5, verses 9 and 10. Y'all listening? Mm -hmm. Paul says, we, that's a plural pronoun. Who's he talking about? We, he's talking about us. He's talking about the church. He's talking about Christians. 
He's talking about he's talking about disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says we make it our aim. We make it our goal. We make it our ambition. Notice what he said, whether present or absent. Whether I am there with you. He's writing to the church at Corinth. He says, whether I am there with you or not. We, the church, the Christians, we we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. I was, I was looking at my notes this morning, and I, I, I was thinking about that phrase, whether, whether present or absent. And I, and I had these thoughts. I, I said, rumor is what people say you are. Reputation is who people think you are. Character is who you really are when no one is around. Mm. Our, our true character is that person we become when no one is watching. And so Paul says, we make it our aim. We, we make it our goal, wh- whether I'm with you in body or whether I am absent. He says, we make it our aim to be well-pleasing to him. Now, why did Paul say this? Verse 10. Why did Paul say we make it our aim, we make it our goal to be well-pleasing to him? He tells us in verse 10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he's done, whether good or bad. And then verse 11, he says, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Persuade people. Not only are we as defenders of the faith to stand against attacks from doubters, not only are we to stand against attacks from skeptics and critics and unbelievers, we also need to recognize that there is a positive side to defending the faith where we as followers of Christ, where we go on the offense and we present the reasonableness of Christianity's truth claims as its sufficiency to meet the spiritual need of of mankind, of humanity. Certainly this is what Jesus had in mind when he said, go therefore to all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. The positive side of defending the faith is the communication of the gospel. Listen to me. The positive side of defending the faith is the communication of the gospel, communicating to people in terms or in words that they can understand. The aim of defending the faith, listen, the aim of defending the faith is not to renounce error. The the aim or the goal of defending the faith is not to point out where people are wrong. The the aim of of, of defending the faith is, is to not tell people that they are wrong, that they're in error to the truth of God's word, but the aim is to bring sinners to repentance. Peter, or Paul, said this in 2 Timothy 2. He says, the servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but he must be gentle, gentle to all. He must be able to teach. He must be patient in humility, correcting those who are in opposition, if God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him, to do his will. And so our goal as Christians when debating a non-believer, listen, our goal as Christians when debating a non-believer is not to win an argument. More importantly, our goal is to win a soul. Therefore, we must always, Peter says, says we must always be ready to defend the faith and to represent and to present the gospel. 
We, we, we need not get tangled up in arguments. We, we need not get tangled up in proofs or defenses and, and critiques that so, so much so that we neglect to give the unbeliever what they truly need, and that is a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what they need most, defending the faith. Defending the faith in evangelism, that's what we're talking about. Defending the faith and witnessing and telling people about Jesus, that's, that's, the, that's the theme of this series, defending the faith and winning the loss to Jesus Christ. These are two distinct concepts taught in Scripture, but the two distinct concepts cannot be divorced from one another. As followers of Christ, we are commanded to engage in both. We are commanded to proclaim the gospel, and we're commanded to defend the faith. Listen to this. Jesus instructed his, his followers to make disciples of all the nations. He warned them to be on guard against false teachers. Paul reminded Timothy to do the work of an evangelist. But he also explained to Titus that church leaders must be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convict those who contradict. Peter encouraged the wives of unbelievers to win their husbands to Christ through their godly behavior. And then a few verses later, he coupled that evangelistic instruction with this command, but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. And he said, do this with meekness and with fear. Jude chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, Jude tells us to contend for the faith. He says, beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary. Listen to what he said. He said, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you, encouraging you to contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain men, look, notice what he says in verse 4. For certain men have crept in unnoticed. Now look at this who long ago were marked out for this condemnation. Who are they? They're ungodly men. And he says they, they turn the grace of God, the grace of our God, into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. But then Jude goes on to say in verses 20 to 23, But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Verse 22. And on some have compassion, making a distinction. Verse 23. But others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. Rescue others, he says, by snatching them from the flames of judgment. And so Jude tells us to show mercy to the unbeliever, but he says to do so with great caution, hating the sins that contaminate their lives. So we have this twofold responsibility as Christians with respect to reaching the world around us. We, we are called as Christians to be defenders of the faith. And we are called as Christians to be a witness at the same time. We are told in Scripture that we are to be protectors and proclaimers. We are taught in Scripture that we are to be defenders and disseminators. To disseminate is to spread abroad as though sowing a seed. We are taught to be advocates and ambassadors. You know what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, 20 and 21? He says we are ambassadors for Christ. You know what an ambassador is? An ambassador is an emissary, uh, someone who has been accredited uh, by uh, 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 an official representative. That's, that's what an ambassador is. He says we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. And so he says we implore you, we beg you, we beseech you, we plead with you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Why? Because God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So being a defender of the faith and being a witness may not be exactly the same, but again, they cannot be divorced from one another. They cannot be separated. 
To confront error is to proclaim the truth, and to proclaim the truth is to confront error. To preach, to share the gospel is to simultaneously destroy arguments and every, every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God as we take every thought into captivity to the obedience of Jesus Christ. If the glory of God, if the glory of God is our ultimate aim, then we cannot be content with just winning an argument. If the glory of God is our ultimate aim, then we cannot just be content with winning an argument. Our desire must be to win the lost. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9, verses 20 and following, he said, to the Jews, I became as a Jew that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law as under the law that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without law as without law that I might win those who are without law. Paul says, to the weak I became as weak that I might win the weak. I've become all things to all men that I might by all means save some. Now this I do for the gospel's sake that I may be partaker of it with you. And so if the glory of God is our ultimate aim, Again, we cannot just be content with winning an argument. We can't just be content with being right. We must have a desire to win the lost. John Piper said this. I came across this quote a couple of weeks ago, and I thought it was fitting, and it makes sense. You've got to think about it. John Piper said this. He says, missions is not the ultimate goal of the church. Let that sink in. Missions is not the ultimate goal of the church. Worship is. Missions exists because worship doesn't. Think about that. If we get our love and devotion for God right, we'll do missions. If we get our love and devotion for God right, we'll be a witness. We'll tell people about Jesus. Everything that we do flows out of our love relationship with God. And so Piper, I think he had it right. Missions is not the ultimate goal of the church. Worship is. Missions exist because worship doesn't. Our efforts to defend the faith, our efforts to, to witness must be fueled, must be motivated by a desire to see God worshiped and glorified by those who currently reject him, by those who refuse to sanctify Christ, to, to sanctify Christ as Lord in their hearts. Some, some closing questions for, for us to think about and to contemplate and to meditate on. Have you sanctified Christ? Have you sanctified Christ as Lord in your heart? Is he really your Lord? Is he really your boss, your master? Have you sanctified Christ as the Lord of your life? Are you prepared? If you have, then are you prepared as a believer as a Christian, as a follower of Christ, as a disciple of Christ, are you prepared to always be ready to give a defense for the hope that is in you? Are you prepared? Are you preparing yourself? Are you, are you getting prepared? Are you studying? Are you reading? Are you preparing yourself to be a defender of the faith? Are you a student of God's Word to the extent that you could explain biblically why you believe what you believe and could you give a defense of your faith with sound doctrine and good theology? Yeah. 
knowing the terror of the Lord and that one day you'll stand before him to give an account, do you make it your aim? Do you make it your goal to be well-pleasing to God and to persuade others to sanctify Christ as Lord in their hearts? Are you an ambassador for Christ? Are you representing him and are you representing him well? And is God pleading through your life? Is God working in your life in such a way that you are imploring others on Christ's behalf to be reconciled to God? Is your ultimate goal in life to glorify and worship God? Are you seeking to glorify God by reaching the lost? Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for these uh, few minutes this morning that you have uh, given us to talk about, um, to, to take a look at your word and to hear what it says and Father, help us to know that, that, that we live in a world of error and that we are called upon, as Christians, we're, we're called upon to live the word of truth and to proclaim the word of truth, to always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks us a reason for the hope that is in us. Father, I pray today for that person who may not be a believer for that person who needs to sanctify Christ as Lord in their hearts, I pray, God, that you would cause that to happen, that you would grant them repentance and give them faith to believe in your Son, Jesus Christ, and, God, that they would sanctify him as Lord in their hearts. Father, for those today who claim that they have already done that, that they have sanctified Christ as Lord in their hearts, who those who make the claim that they are disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, that they are followers of Christ. God, I pray that you would use this message to convict us, Father, of our negligence in, in proclaiming the gospel and for being a witness. God, we, we, again, we, we live in a world of error. So many people that we encounter each and every day are lost without Christ, and they need Christ. And God, the means that you have chosen them to come to faith in Christ is through the sharing of the gospel. It's through your people, your children, your church, sharing the gospel and telling people about Jesus and being a witness. God, convict us for our negligence and help us to be proclaimers of truth in a world of error that people might hear and be saved. Faith comes by hearing and by the word of God. Help us, Father, to be students of your word so that we can boldly proclaim it and so that we can boldly defend it. I pray, Father, that you'd continue to be with us now as we continue to worship you. God, I pray that you would lay someone on our heart this morning that's lost. God, that we would diligently cry out to you on their behalf. That, God, you would take us and use us instruments of your grace to share with them your love. We know that you love the world so much that you were willing to send your son Jesus Christ to die for it. So God help us to be ambassadors.